I just realized I didn't see it, so. Thank you. All right, so yeah, anybody watching this recording afterwards, I, I have already kind of started a little bit. I forgot to start the recording, so. Uh, but basically at this point, um, I've been recapping, uh, I haven't got too far, so we've been recapping the basic components of the competing system um, and kind of going over the important parts of what I think of. So everybody, you know, if, if one thing kind of from this chapter, or at least from the first two or three chapters, is, is you ought to kind of understand this idea of what, if somebody says a von Neumann architecture or a, or a stored program um, architecture, kind of what we mean by that. And there's a couple of things that we mean by that, you know, so, and I was just talking right now that this idea of a stored program, basically there's just one idea of a main or primary memory and everything is put in there, instructions, data, you know, and, and, uh, and you can further kind of think of data, it depends on the context, you know, of how you're going to interpret. So, so whatever you need to represent, you give some definition or some standard uh, for a bit pattern so you can represent the different kinds of things and then you can use the basic operations that your computer architecture instruction set provides to manipulate that data right um, yeah and then kind of back to the CPU so so the the architecture the instruction set architecture it, 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 uh, it as our textbook talks a little bit about um, it doesn't provide you know specific program so, so you don't normally hard code in like a particular algorithm um, I mean you can do that so, so you, you might for, for particular embedded computers um, you could just hard code in the actual program as your circuit uh, at your circuit level and, and in some cases like the things running your uh, embedded systems are kind of like that you know like your microwaves and things like that are relatively simpler systems but, but the idea for a stored program system is, you know, we want just a general, relatively uh, simple set of instructions that are hardwired and this general procedure, the fetch execute cycle that we'll talk more about um, and some other things, so that you can move most of the the task of creating programs you know cr creating things that actually process data and do work and tasks into software right so i, I think it was in this chapter that that we made a that we kind of talked about software versus hardware um but um so yeah that, the, so with that those basic pieces in in, in in mind then then you know people software engineers and computer scientists uh, of course, are more on the software side. You know, if, if you're interested in, in getting into the chip design stuff, you'd want to be more um, uh, kind of as an electrical engineer or a computer engineer, um, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, once you have these basic components and this basic idea of a generic computing system, then you can build up from that, you know, starting kind of with the operating system, which adds another layer of abstraction. And then on top of that, that gives you general purpose tools for writing applications for the most part. So, um, yeah, and then kind of just to finish this out here, um, so, you know, I mostly talk about the CPU and the main memory. So, um, um, most people define kind of as that there's four top level components to the computer system. So, besides your processor and memory, um, you have I.O. modules, and then you'll have some interconnect. So, some sort of interconnection mechanism uh, to connect those to all together because you have to get data. And, and um, in some ways, the memory and, and I.O. devices, um, they're kind of the same. So, so both of these are really just ways of, of storing data so that it can be available for the CPU or for you know, getting data in and out of the system so it can be available to the CPU, right? So um, in, in many ways, um, there's a lot of similarity from the CPU's point of view. So you know, whether it's reading or writing uh, some data or a block of data to an I.O. device, or reading or writing some data or a block of data to uh, main memory, uh, from its point of view, it's just some sort of a source that it can either, you know, get data from or send data to, right? So, but yeah, I.O. devices in general, yeah, so, so you often do have some idea of, of like addresses or things, 
in order to uh, um, address an I.O. device, um, but it's not just a general thing. So often those, uh, you know, if, if you're if, if you're communicating to do like a read or a write and, and you give something that you think of as an address, that would be represent like a port or some specific sub part of the IO device that you're trying to um, interact with, right? And, and so, so IO devices are much more, um, you know, varied than, than uh, memory, right? So, so I'm pretty much all memory, um, no matter kind of what the different, um, technology is uh, from the CPU's point of view, it's just a big array of, of buckets that hold bytes. Um, but but IO devices are a little bit more varied. Uh, we, um, you know, we will talk a little bit about some of those in this class, but, but not as much as kind of some of these other things. But there are two kind of big divisions of, of IO devices. So, so you, can, you can in general think of IO devices as either um, character by character, so byte by byte devices, or block devices, you know. So, so on the one hand, certain things like a mice and keyboard, they mostly uh, send data to uh, the computer, kind of one character or one word at a time. Um, and that's kind of the most logical way to think of interacting with them. But other devices, uh, mainly um, um, external memory, basically hard drives um, are, block devices so, so you normally transfer things um uh, you know in 512 or 1024 or some number of bytes at a time um, uh. um all right questions i think we kind of hit most of these points here Uh, so yeah, I mean, this is all kind of important. So, so with, with this general idea, um, that, uh, yeah, so here's kind of what I was trying to look for about software. So, so with, with this general idea of a general purpose computing device, then you can, you can separate hardware from software and, and then, you know, uh, you don't have to envision the exact task that your computing type, your computing system is going to do. You can, uh, program different applications and, and, and different uh, tasks into it uh, that make use of this general purpose um, hardware, you know, um, hardwired uh, design. So um, a, a question about posting videos. Yeah, um, I do post the videos. Um, so, so far I post all the videos. Um, so kind of as a reminder on that, so I, I, I occasionally find out people kind of don't know. Um, all the videos right now for this class, you should be able to find them on the um, the, the, the official uh, YouTube playlist. So uh, right now there's, a, there's an, a link to that under the additional resources. I hope to put some more stuff under additional resources here, but, um, but yeah, you, you can find, you should be able to find all the past ones uh, on there. So. Um, Okay, so in my notes, uh, oh, well, let me now skip ahead. So let's let's kind of go then on to um, the fetch execute cycle. So I think I mostly talked about this, these components, um, and, and you know this this was a bit of overlap. So we we talked about um, a couple of these concepts uh, in the previous chapter as well. Um, so then then the next section um, was a little bit about the, the function. So again, we're talking in a generic sense here. Um, and later on, I'll, I, I didn't have a lot of notes about the hypothetical machine, but maybe I'll kind of walk you through this. So hopefully everybody was able to understand this example of their generic hypothetical machine here from our textbook. Um, so yeah, I mean, as far as I know, I mean, all CPUs work like this, um, uh, at its most basic level, they're just continually fetching and executing instructions, right? And as I already mentioned, uh, you know, fetch is, is relatively simple compared to execute. Um, um, uh, but that's basically the idea. There's some register 
often called the program counter, that's a memory address. And every time you're at the fetch part of the fetch execute cycle, whatever memory address is indicated by the program counter, um, a request is made out uh, on the system bus out to main memory to transfer the, the, the data um, that the program counter is pointing to from memory to the instruction register. That's, so that's the fetch, right? And, and then as a side effect of the fetch, um, the pro program counter is usually incremented automatically. Um, although I should say, I mean, in our hypothetical machine, it's, it's incremented by one, um, as we'll come to. But really, for, for real systems, um, you know, it depends on the size of your instruction set, uh, your, the, your, your system architecture size, right? So like for a 32-bit machine, that means, for one thing, that instructions are actually in 32 bits. So they actually fit in four bytes or four memory addresses, right? So whenever, whenever you do a fetch, um, you're fetching the, the, the four bytes, um, you know, the, the address that the program counter um, references plus three bytes after that in memory, right? For a 32 bit architecture. And, so, and for 64 bit, um, um, yeah, and so, so I believe that, that, that they are, that that implies that, um, I, should, I should look that up. Hopefully I'm not saying something wrong, but, uh, but I think that's true. So for 64-bit architecture, um, you know, you, you've moved up to 64-bit um, basically for your uh, instruction set architecture. The, 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 the bit size is really more important for the memory, the, the fundamental size of the memory addresses. Uh, like 32-bit versus 64-bit, right? So, so I'm not certain. I should probably look that up about the instruction. Um, uh, but anyway, so let's say that's true. So, um, so for the fetch, for like typically for like a 32-bit, if your instructions fit in 32 bits, um, that's really four memory addresses. So the program counter um, would actually automatically increment by four normally. Um, on the fetch cycle to, to move it to what is expected to be the next instruction after the one that we just fetched, right? Um, 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 and then the, the execute portion um, is, is, is a bit, certainly more complex than, than the, the fetch portion. So, um, and as we talked a little bit about last week, um, you know, so especially for a, a CISC architecture, a complex instruction set um, architecture, uh, uh, an instruction could take multiple machine cycles to actually execute that instruction. So what's, what's hidden down here, not only do, you know, uh, so, so the first thing that kind of happens typically on the execute instruction, uh, in the CPU and in, in the, the the chip logic is um, a, a, some kind of decoding phase. So the first cycle or two is typically to decode the opcode, um, and then maybe also decode and pull out um, um, register or memory um, references that might be part of the instruction set um, um, architecture. So. And then after that, you know, when you execute, again, you know, uh, to execute, it could take multiple cycles, um, but um, um, basically, though, depending on which opcode it is, there'll, there'll be a separate set of circuits on the CPU. For, so, you know, so the add instruction has one set of, of circuits in the CPU design and, and subtract has another and load has another and so on. So, so, so you know, it's like a big switch statement, basically. Um, so whatever the op that needs to be executed, different hard uh, uh, circuits are, are created to perform that operation. On, on the semiconductor chip, right? Um, for our hypothetical machine, they, de they defined it, it was kind of like a 16-bit architecture. So they defined actually all memory actually had uh, two bytes or 16 bits instead of one byte, right? So, and so that was kind of one reason though why, that, that's a little bit different from, from x86 and ARM, um, from my understanding of, of their modern one. So, but but in that case, since um, 
uh, it's kind of like 16-bit, but since memory is, is addressable on 16-bit boundaries, uh, the program counter increments by one every time uh, for the fetch execute cycle to go to the next 16-bit uh, word of memory, right? Um, so here is um, um, something that I that I touched on. I, yeah, I was trying to remember kind of the four categories that our textbook had broken up. Um, instructions into so uh, to me I mean processor memory versus processor IO you know may or may not want to think of that as a separate category they probably work pretty similar if not the same on most CPUs so, so these are the these are loads and stores basically whether you're loading or storing to memory or loading or storing to um, an IO device but you're doing something over the system bus to transfer data uh, and then the other two are control or flow of control kinds of instructions. Um, so those are mostly like jumps and conditional jumps um, and data processing uh, instructions. So those are your arithmetic and logic, basically, among other things. So, you know, um, a Boolean logic uh, and or not on bit patterns are one type. And then you normally do have built in operations for uh, integer and floating point arithmetic, <clears throat> excuse me, um, um, for doing some basic arithmetic. So. Um, so I skipped over, you know, again, this is kind of just a generic CPU, um, you know, so, these registers, like, like I think both ARM and x86 call the program counter the program counter PC, um, but but they 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 probably you probably don't won't find something like called MAR, which is a mem uh, for our generic description. You know, this is just supposed to represent um, a register that can hold a a general uh, memory address when we're doing um, um, an I/O kind of an operation, right? Um, and then our hypothetical machine, it also defines uh, something it calls an accumulator, which is, is really in this hypothetical machine was a, just a general purpose register, right? So, so for most CPU architectures that I've done stuff with, uh, you often have a couple of general purpose registers, like, uh, like an x86 that used to be called like, you know, just A, B, C, D. So if you want to, you could load one piece of data into register A and another piece of data into register B, and then perform an add operation where you tell it to add register A and B and put the result into C, that kind of thing. So that, that was kind of um, that was a kind of the basic idea here. So um, so yeah let me talk about this hypothetical machine. Does anybody have a question? Um, so, so again, this isn't, you know, this isn't x86, this isn't ARM. In fact, uh, if you look at this, this is kind of, uh, kind of almost in between, right? So typically for, so for example, for, um, for an x86, uh, you might have an instruction, like an add instruction. So here, the, the add um, part of, if, if you're, to implement this add, you'd, you'd have to do a couple of different things. So for one thing, after you decode, um, so let's look at, uh, so, so here the, the, the five, so the bit pattern five. So, so here the, these are supposed to represent hexadecimal numbers, right? So, so hexadecimal um, uh, has a value from zero to F, um, um, which can put into four bits. Um, so there's 16 bits in total and each digit represents four bits here. So it's a little bit tough to, to see that these are actually hexadecimal because he doesn't have any A, B, C's or F's, right? So you could, you could maybe misunderstand and think that this are re, re, that this are just decimal numbers, but they're really hexadecimal and you know that because we've defined that, um, you know, we're using 16 bits for our um, instruction format and our integer format here, right? 
So anyway, since since each digit represents four bits um, in a hex representation, you know, the, the bit pattern 0001 is going to be load instructions, or first instruction is a load. Uh, one zero is a, is a two decimal or hexadecimal, so that's a, a store instruction. Um, one zero one is, you know, two to the power of two plus two to the power of zero, so that's four plus one or five. Um, so that's a, a store instruction. And then the other 12 bits of our instruction format represent an address, right? So what I was getting at is this isn't um, um, quite a complex instruction set, but it's not quite um, reduced instruction set either. So, so like for this, um, like, like if we have a load instruction, we would have to well, decode it, sorry, an add instruction. We have to decode it, but part of this, so, so we'd have to be performing a fetch from memory. So, so the 941 means not really a fetch from memory, um, but um, uh, we want to add whatever's in memory address 941 to the accumulator to perform the add here down on our step three or four, the second fetch execute cycle here, right? Um, so probably the way that would work in x86 or ARM is, um, well, let's talk about for x86, uh, you, would, you, you do have instructions like that where you have add, uh, but you also have uh, things that can represent multiple, like uh, add uh, all in one instruction, add this memory address to this register and put the result in the register, or add this memory address to this memory address and put the result back out to a memory address. So you, can, you can specify something like that, that logically requires three kinds of reads and writes, you know, so fetch from one memory address, fetch a value from another memory address, add those together and store the result back into a memory address. So that's that's kind of a, com a very complex. So, you, and you might need many cycles, you know, one cycle for each one of the, fe the, the reads or the writes that I just described, you know, one to perform the actual calculation, um, possibly other cycles, right? So here, um, uh, we might need like one cycle to actually fetch the value from 941, maybe into like uh, the, the processor into like a, a temporary register or a register that can only be used by the CPU. So, so maybe maybe that's kind of how you might implement this hypothetical machine architecture here. Um, so 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 the, the 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 load part of our ad is is like some general register that that the programmer doesn't the, or the the instruction set architecture doesn't have a direct way of, of manipulating that right. Um, and then you perform the ad, and then in this case you put it back. I'm um, out there, so uh, put, put the result back out into the accumulator. So, so in this hypothetical machine, the accumulator is kind of like a general purpose um, architecture, or sorry, a general purpose register, I should say, you know, so like a load instruction basically um, just takes a value uh, and, and stuffs it into the register, right? So like in x86, um, uh, you have load instruction, but you can say load into register A or re register B. Yeah, so you have multiple general purpose registers um, um, from from my memory of the last time I used an x86 kind of down at this level, right? Yeah, if anybody knows, feel free to correct me if anybody's been doing any kind of uh, assembly or machine language more recently, you know, um, kind of how things have evolved, but um, I guess, and then the final point that I was trying to work up to though, so if this was a, um, like, like for an ARM, a reduced instruction set, probably you wouldn't have an add instruction like this that, that would have to do an add, but also would have to do like a, an implied fetch of one address in memory. So back in chapter two, in fact, we showed uh, an example of some risk instruction. So most likely you would have an add instruction, but the add would only work on uh, data that's already in registers loaded into memory. So, so for a reduced instruction set, I would explicitly have to load um, or maybe um, um, set one register to the value of, of, of three 
or, or well, I'd have to do one load to, to load the value of three into one register and then do a second load to load my other value of two to another register. And then I would perform my add, uh, which might be implied to add those two registers and put them into a third register or into, in, or into a, a result register that maybe you can't write to the result register, but it holds the result of, of arithmetic operations. Um, and then if I want to store that result, I would have to, to explicitly store uh, the register, you know, to, to a memory address. So. All right, so hopefully, hopefully that kind of makes sense. So again, um, to, to summarize all that, you know, this hypothetical machine architecture isn't meant to represent either really a RISC or a CISC. Um, to my mind, it's a little bit in between. You know, so if it was more of a RISC, um, we wouldn't have an ad like this that also has, is doing some memory fetches um, as part of the ad operation. But if it was more like a x86 CISC, uh, we, we might have an add, but we might have multiple, um, you know, the ability to um, specify multiple um, um, source memory addresses so that we could directly um, add just two um, indicated memory addresses and, and even have a third one and, you know, and store the result of that um, out in a third memory address, all as one single complex instruction so all right so hopefully that makes sense um and uh, you know hopefully you know you could um walk yourself through this example right um i think as i've already touched on probably the biggest thing that was a little bit different from this hypothetical machine is that um, um i mean if you're using like a 32-bit or 64-bit architecture then your um, registers um, are probably going to be 32 bits or 64 bits um, um, by default but um, memory is still um, always addressable um, as an 8-bit word or a one-byte word right so so yeah, whenever you're fetching an instruction, you'll be in, uh, fetching from multiple uh, locations in memory um, um, uh, to fetch one instruction. And whenever you're doing a load, um, so normally like on x86, if I remember right, I mean, you do have load instructions, but you can specify, you know, do I want to do a, a, a one word load? So just, just get one memory address or eight bits, or I could do a two word load or a four word load. Um, and, um, or, and I'm sure for 64 bit, you can do an eight word load to, to get a full 64 bits um, from eight memory locations. And, and likewise store, you know, so you have uh, different ways of, of specifying a store to get one byte, two bytes, four bytes, eight bytes um, to a register or half register or um, things like that. So. Um, all right, does that, uh, does that make sense, hopefully? Um, yeah, I, I noticed I didn't really have a whole lot of notes on here, but, but, uh, but that doesn't, I mean, you really should definitely read this, make sure you understand kind of all these things in here. So, um, I guess maybe the other thing that I'll point out before I go on, and maybe I will kind of change my mind here. I might take a little bit of a break um, and then we'll kind of come back and get into the, the, uh, the more actually specific things of, of our interconnects here a little bit. Um, but um, yeah, in our uh, example here, we really only had examples of control and processor memory instructions. Um, or sorry, of, of, of data processing and processor memory instructions. Or uh, yeah, it's really processor memory because the load is supposedly loading from memory and the store is actually storing to memory. So those would be both examples of processor memory. Um, and our add instruction is an example of, of a, an arithmetic, right? So, so it might've been a good idea to have an example of a control statement. So let's say we have like a, just a, a, um, a um, a jump statement um, so and, and have not a conditional jump but just an absolute jump right so, so normally in your instruction set you'll have two kinds of jumps 
just absolute jumps that always happen or sometimes you'll jump on a condition. So jump if this register was zero or jump if this register is not zero or, or some other kinds of conditions like that, right? But, uh, but I, I mean, you, you can imagine, so maybe we'd, we would define, I don't know, uh, say three for our jump. So, so there's no, uh, uh, there's no opcode that we have defined yet um, for the bit pattern three, which would be zero zero one one. Right. So let, let, let's say maybe at instruction three hundred three, memory um, was a jump back to three hundred. So, so you know, so you might use the bit pattern zero zero one one to indicate the jump opcode, and then the same kind of uh, twelve bits for the address, say to jump back to. 300. So in that case, we want to keep adding. Um, uh, if we do that, we'd be in an infinite loop that keeps adding to uh, to the accumulator over and over, right? Um, but yeah, in that case, for our, our step five, you know, if we, if we fetched um, um, a jump, which would be something like 3300 in hex, if I want to do an absolute jump back to memory address 300, um, and then that when you execute, so the execution of a uh, control, basically, instead of affecting a register, um, would affect the program counter, right? So when you actually execute the jump, what would happen is it would just write 300 into the program counter, and then you would be basically back to here, except for you got a different value in the accumulator now. You have five in the accumulator, but you would go back and start fetching and executing from the program counter location 300. Um, to, uh, oh, I guess, uh, actually, it wouldn't keep adding two because, um, yeah, if I jump to 300, it loads three and adds two. So it would just keep adding three plus two, five, but then it would, it would overwrite that. So, yeah, if I wanted to keep adding two, I shouldn't jump to 300. I should have jumped to 301 if I wanted to do kind of what I was talking about. So if you jump to 301, um, it would just perform the add again. So it would keep adding two um, and then jumping back to 301. So. Um, but um, anyway, that's um, um, an example of that, that type of instruction. And, and yeah, you should be kind of clear on those in general, what they do at this sort of generic level of description. So. Um, All right, and uh, let me talk about, um, I mean, and there are more details in here, so uh, fleshing out a little bit even more, some examples of, of kind of the sub things that might happen as part of the, um, the, the fetch, especially the, the, the execute, you know, so, you know, like, like decoding the op, operand, uh, the, decoding the op code, um, uh, doing something, you know, decoding or, or get, pulling out the operand address for our hypothetical machine. Uh, performing the fetch if you have to on the operand. And, and again, you might have multiple of those, like I was saying, for a more complex instruction set, you could have two or even three memory addresses that are the part of the instruction. Um, so you'd have to perform all of those uh, loads beforehand to do your operation. Um, and then you might have, again, a store um, afterwards um, uh, an implied or an explicit store back out to memory. So. Um, all right, and, and um, yeah, let, let me let me talk a little bit about instructions, and then maybe I'll take a five minute break here. Or sorry, about interrupts, and I'll take a five minute break. So um, again, I didn't I didn't have a lot to say, but that doesn't mean they're kind of important. So so you should. Um, um, uh, make certain you kind of understand interrupts and, and in, again, in general at this level of description, how they work, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, again, you can talk about different classes of interrupts, um, program or timer or, or generated by hardware um, uh, conditions. Um, kind of the most important thing about an interrupt is um, they're really, um, The, the, they're really there for um, performance reasons, okay? 
so basically, I mean, even the fastest memories, but, but also other devices, so, so um, IO devices especially, are many times slower than kind of the, 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 the CPU cycle speed, um, you know, the, the, the baseline processor um, uh, cycle speed that you have on your CPU, right? So typically, like, like, like hard drives and IO devices are, are at least two orders of magnitude slower. I mean, it's like a thousand times slower, right? So, and I think that's even kind of uh, an underestimate. So, so the, there might even be more, um, so two orders would be a hundred, so more like three orders of magnitude, hundred to a thousand times slower. So, so that, anyway, that, that kind of means that, um, um, you know, even at the fastest, um, um, if, if you want to read or write a, a piece of data to an IO device that's a hundred or a thousand times slower, um, if you have to wait for that read or that write to complete, um, you're going to be waiting around for thousands or maybe tens of thousands of, of CPU cycles doing nothing while the IO device is performing your requested operation, your, your requested read or write, right? Um, so if you did that, I mean, that, that, you know, every CPU cycle that you're just uh, uh, waiting instead of actually doing a calculation, um, um, you're, you know, wasting resources. You're, you're, you're not getting stuff done that you could possibly do. So the basic idea behind interrupts, it's, it's a parallel parallelism mechanism. It's, it's a way to parallelize things. So instead of doing a read and having to wait for the, uh, the IO, you know, a reader or write, having to wait for the IO device to complete it and signal back that it's complete, what you do is, is you request, let's say you're right, uh, but then you can the, the CPU continues um, um, working, and so it can continue doing other calculations. What the I/O device does is, when it finishes that that write that I just talked about, it instead informs the the CPU by uh, generating an interrupt. So in this case, I'm describing a um, an I/O interrupt here uh, to signal normal completion of a write. Um, operation in this case, right? Um, so we do that and, and you know, you should, I won't go into the, a lot of the details of, of this, but uh, we do that basically because um, Uh, kind of like shown in part B here of our figure 3.7. Um, when we come to a right, um, you know, we, we might jump to an, uh, a, a, an IO program to actually perform the right. So this sets up um, the things in order to write the, the data, let's say, out to a hard drive, a disk. Right. But then inst instead of waiting for it to complete, um, the, the IO controller will just, because, because after the write, you might have to do some additional things um, um, after the write completes. Um, so it, instead of waiting for the IO device to tell us that it completes, uh, the, the IO subroutine returns immediately and we continue doing some extra work. And then at some point while we're doing other work, hopefully before the next thing we need to write, um, the, 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 the device is actually done, it generates an interrupt. Um, and then we come to our interrupt panel, we do whatever we have to do to finish up that IO, that, that write here as I'm talking about, okay? So again, this represents parallelism. So everything from here to here, we are still doing work in the CPU while the IO device is completing the write. That we requested for us. Okay. As long as we have enough work that we're not performing writes faster than um, the I/O device can actually complete it um, uh, before we get to the next one, uh, you know, we get we don't end up having any wasted CPU cycles at all, right? Um, but um, if we get to like, like if you can only have one write at a time. 
if we get to the next write before we've completed the first one, uh, you might still end up having to do some waiting. Um, um, so, so it might be unavoidable. So, so, you, so, um, so maybe you can't perform the second write until you've got the, uh, you know, your first one finished. So in that case, most what computing systems do is that that's the reason why we have operating systems um, and we, we want them to be able to run multiple programs at the same time. So that, that if one program really is stuck waiting on some IO to complete, we can maybe do some work on another program for a while, right? So that, that's, that's one of the things that uh, you, you should talk about in your operating systems course when you take that, so, um, uh, that kind of idea. Um, okay, so, you know, that, when you add in interrupts to the generic idea of a computing system, I mean, that, that makes the, the generic flow of control of, of your processor a little bit more complex. So after fetch execute, uh, basically, you know, this, this um, interrupts are asynchronous. So that means at any point an interrupt can arrive. So the basic cycle becomes, you know, you fetch an instruction, you execute it, and then you check and if, if you have interrupts enabled, you check and see if there is an interrupt. And if there is, we're not going to end up fetching the next instruction. So that's the, the other thing that you really make sure, need to understand. Um, and that's uh, discussed in figure 3.8 here. Um, and, um, or is it, uh, I must have passed it. Um, oops, sorry. So um, the other things about interrupts, you know, make sure that you understand that they're um, asynchronous. Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing what I was looking for, but um, so the idea, I mean, an interrupt can occur anywhere um, between any two instructions. So what happens is um, in, in the CPU, so there's, there's some hardware mechanisms and some software-based mechanisms that are used to handle interrupts, okay? So in general, you should understand that an interrupt is kind of like calling a function or calling a procedure. So if an interrupt does occur, what happens at the, the hardware level, the CPU level, is that um, there's going to be some table, and, and this has to be set up by the programmer. So, so this will be set up somewhere in memory. So it's kind of a software mechanism. But, but the table is going to be something that says if interrupt type one or interrupt type two occurs, then jump to this address. And then, you know, you, you, the, the program is also responsible for putting the interrupt handler into memory at that particular address, okay? But the other thing that, 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 that's done as part of the hardware is that um, before it does that jump, it actually saves the program counter probably in like a special register so that um, it can set the program counter as part of the interrupt handling to uh, where it was told to go for the interrupt handler, right? Um, and then the interrupt handler will run, um, and then the last instruction, so often, again, there's, there's gonna be an instruction that's part of the instruction set architecture, which is like return from interrupt, or I'm, I'm finished with the interrupt, and that will, will load that instruction out of the special register back in the program counter so that you resume back at the next instruction where you um, were interrupted, all right? And it's slightly more complex than that. Uh, I'll, I'll add on to that a little bit here. So for one, for example, the hardware usually only saves the program counter, like I described, but the, the problem is, is that this interrupt handler is code. And if this interrupt handler is doing things like changing registers or doing calculations, uh, th th that causes a problem when you return because um, if I needed, if I had been in the middle of performing a calculation, so I had the result of a calculation in my registers, and, and if my interrupt handler changes those re registers, that, then when I return back from, from the interrupt, um, my calculation is going to be messed up, right? Um, but um, the, the, usually the CPU doesn't take that to account. The only thing the CPU does is push the, the instruction um, 
uh, into a register or pushes it somewhere so that it can return when, when the interrupt handler is done. Um, but and then it's up to the interrupt handler though that if it needs to use registers and things, it has to like save any registers that it needs and other things like program status words and things. It has to save those somewhere before it starts doing its work of the interrupt handler and then it needs to make certain it, it carefully restores all those like registers before um, it calls that special instruction to return from the interrupt, all right? So, so yeah, I mean, you have to be aware of that. And, but that in general happens, um, th this is very, very similar to also calling functions. Um, so th there's usually support in the operating system for doing uh, function calls or subroutine calls, um, and, and they work in kind of a similar way to uh, interrupt handling, right? Um, and they work in a very similar way because, if I can say one last thing here, so most of the time for, um, in, in our architectures for uh, handling interrupts, we allow for the possibility for nested interrupts, okay? So in that case, we could be in the middle of, of one interrupt handler when another interrupt occurs, and, and we allow that to happen so that we jump to another, a second interrupt handler while we were in the middle of processing our first interrupt, okay? To do this though implies that I can't have a single register um, because I need to, to save the, the uh, program counter for the return from the original interrupt, but if I need to jump to my second interrupt, I need to ch save this return program counter for the return from the second interrupt, and, and these can be arbitrarily nested in, in a full, um, uh, uh, nesting of interrupt architecture. So, you know, I, I could be, I could end up being three, four, five, many um, interrupts deep, okay? So that implies I can't have just a single register. I have to actually maintain a stack of, of interrupt return uh, program counters, right? And again, normally, uh, so what happens normally is there is one register which represents the start, what the current top of the stack is for my interrupt return addresses, right? And every time a new interrupt occurs, I push my current program counter onto my interrupt stack. And that um, interrupt stack um, is just gonna be out in, in general memory, right? So that, that, that uh, special register that points to the top of the interrupt stack is just some memory address out in memory that has to be set up by the programmer of the operating system, um, you know, the, the, the user of the computing chip, right? And so, so in order to support this kind of nested um, interrupts, I, I just, if I am nesting, I, I just continue to push on my return program counter address uh, every time I need to uh, go to a, a new interrupt. And then every time I hit a return from interrupt instruction, I pop that address off, back off, put that into the program counter, um, and, and that ends up decrementing my interrupt uh, uh, memory address that from the top of the stack, you know, um, um, gets decremented. So that the next time I do a pop, I, I, I pop that next address from my stack, right? Um, All right, so to just to summarize that, so, so for real, uh, most systems that I'm aware of, they, they do kind of work more like this rather than, I mean, you can force it so that if I am within one interrupt, you could disable interrupts, um, so that way you force the interrupt handler to, to return um, before I can ever process the next interrupt. But then you have to worry about, you know, is there something buffering these? Um, if, if I do have multiple, possibly have multiple interrupts, coming in the system at the same time. Um, uh, I think x86 and ARM tend to support more of like this nested and you have a stack of interrupt, um, you know, you have a stack somewhere in memory for your interrupt returns to keep the, uh, the return address from the interrupt again. And, uh, and basically the same mechanism is also available for um, supporting what's known as function call or procedure call. Um, programming, right? So, so you'll have a different special register, but every um, process you might have running um, on your system um, 
you'll have a register to keep track of a function call stack. Anytime a function calls another function, you just push um, you know, your current program counter on your function call stack. And every time you hit return, um, you pop that back off. Um, and then usually your compiler has to be set up to correctly, uh, like, I talk, like I talked about for the interrupt handler, your compiler, um, when it's implementing function calls, normally has to do the work of saving any registers it needs to use inside that function and then restoring them before it returns from the function. So, Okay, um, actually, so um, as usual, I kind of uh, talking, end up talking longer than I thought I would on that. Uh, any any kind of quick questions on that? I, I do want to take um, probably a little five minute break here. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about um, the interconnect stuff here. Okay, uh, I'm gonna pause here. Um, and um, yeah, let's let's come back at about probably eight thirty-five. So that'd be about seven minutes according to my clock here. So. Uh, okay, I'm back here. Let me get started again. Um, yeah, as usual, I kind of. <laughs> when I get talking on these things, I can keep talking longer than I think usually. Um, so there, there were one or two things um, um, that I kind of do want to point out here um, on these last sections. Um, but um, but I might kind of uh, skip over a little bit more than, than what I did on the first part here. Um, so the, the, the rest of our sections, especially the, the next two after this, are kind of talking more specifically, or the next three are, are, are talking more specifically about um, um, some real interconnect uh, mechanisms. So PCI, E, and um, the, the Q, Intel's QPI here. Um, so the, the, the interconnect or the bus, um, or like PCI, I mean, you know, as, as, as software people, uh, this stuff is, is very well hidden usually. Uh, I mean, unless you're down um, writing device drivers for things, um, you know, you, you won't ever run across uh, kind of any of these uh, kinds of concepts or, or kind of know all these details that are happening. You know, um, uh, even for device driver writers, uh, a lot of the stuff, and as I'll talk about here a little bit, like PCI E, um, uh, is abstracted away from you in, in a kind of uh, protocol. So, uh, anyway, uh, uh, you know, we, we spend most of our time thinking about it's probably easiest to think about, you know, the, the processor and main memory, maybe IO devices, but the, the interconnection structures. Um, um, that, that connect the pieces up are, of course, um, um, important. Uh, these all have to have, um, they often have to have standards defined for them um, and they, they have to be engineered. Um, so anyway, so, so kind of as I talked about here, I, or I, I did talk about this a little bit previously. Um, again, this is generically, um, uh, the idea of sort of the signals that, that you might have coming in and out of the three sorts of models that we talked about. Um, and, and, you know, I'll point out again, you know, the, the memory and IO modules from the point of view of the CPU are pretty similar um, most of the time. Although this is kind of um, especially interrupt signals. So typically um, the, the CPU um, uh, the way it handles memory, main memory, primary memory being uh, an order of magnitude slower than it or two um, is by caching or doing other things, right? So, so it, it, um, uh, we use other mechanisms to, um, um, to, to, to lessen or ameliorate kind of those differences in performance. 
but for IO is, is another magnitude or so slower than, than primary memory. So that those are the things that, that we generally um, are going to be getting interrupts back and forth from, uh, as well as other hardware components possibly. So, so yeah, I guess this may be a little bit incorrect. So, so like one of the um, interrupts that was mentioned was like, um, uh, uh, memory errors, you know, so, so if, if any hardware detects a, um, an error of some kind, I mean, there's often like a defined um, interrupt signal uh, to, to communicate that to the CPU so that in your software, you can have an interrupt handler to do something about that, even if it's just shutting down the system or, or blue screen or something, but um, yeah. Um, So interconnections are really just about the, the collection of, of paths and the way you communicate data back and forth, right? And of course, you know, the, 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 this is solidly electrical engineering, um, but, but, you know, they're, they're very complex um, and, and, and certainly, you know, um, you can spend whole courses on, on even just, um, you know, one subtopic, you know, like like a like point to point interconnect designs or, or whatever. Um, so, um, yeah. Oh, there's one thing. Uh, so I should mention real quickly before I move on here. Um, um, so, so it's easy to think about transferring a single byte back and forth from memory to processor, processor to memory, or from processor to an IO device or IO device back to the processor, right? Uh, but actually, probably one of the bigger, more important types of transfer is what's known as direct memory access. Um, um, and I don't know why, but our, our book, I'm sure, probably talks about DMA, direct memory access, some other places, but, but that's really what kind of IO2 from memory is. Uh, and typically, uh, direct memory access is going to be transferring like blocks at a time. So, so, to, so why this is very important is, is a, a lot of data comes as reading blocks to or from a hard drive into main memory. So, so when I first want to run a program, I, I first kind of load it from a hard drive into main memory before I can start executing it, right? Um, and typically, for again, for efficiency or performance reasons, the CPU just sets up a direct memory um, transfer, um, and then it uh, leaves it to um, the submodules, the memory uh, and the IO device to actually do the, the transfer of, of a bunch of data uh, independently while the CPU can, can go off and do some other things. And, and again, you know, normally um, an interrupt would be generated once the DMA is done so that you, you can you know, load the next block from your disk into memory of your program and, and so on, right? Um, So, yeah, there's not a whole lot to say about bus interconnects. Um, to tell you the truth, um, I would have said that, that uh, these were the main, if you opened up a general purpose computer, um, that, that a, um, a, a bus rather than a point-to-point -point, uh, communication method. Um, but uh, um, so something that I kind of learned is for modern, uh, uh, general purpose computers, you're more likely to actually be using point-to-point uh, -point mechanisms instead of a general purpose bus, okay? So uh, a general purpose bus is really kind of just a shared set of transmission lines, uh, a shared transmission medium. Um, so, I mean, it's really a parallel, um, uh, like a parallel port. Uh, it's, it's, it's a way, it's multiple lines, multiple electrical lines, uh, one line for each bit, and then there's other lines for control mechanisms and things, right? So kind of the original first computing systems just used a, a simple bus. Um, uh, this, this has some drawbacks as, as I'll talk about when we talk about the, the point to point interconnect. Um, so, you know, you have to worry about collision. So, so how do you, how do you um, negotiate who currently has control of the bus so that it can get some data on or off of it? to communicate between the two components. And then, you know, if you have a single shared bus, all of your components 
have to somehow connect to that one shared bus um, and they have to manage um, the, the competition, the, the contention to, to use the bus, right? Um, and, uh, yeah, and, 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 you know, I'll let you guys read the details of this. So, you know, um, so I'm going to go into a lot of this, um, but, um, you know, you typically have different kinds of control lines that make up a, a typical system bus. So some of them are, are uh, so different kinds of lines for your system bus. Some of them are, are for, um, transmitting an, address information and some for the actual data and then some are for control functions um, to, uh, to do different kinds of things so again typically you know what you do like like for example if I want to transfer some data from the CPU to memory um, the, the CPU has to, to, to negotiate to get control of the bus once it's sure it has control of the bus um, um, it'll put control line saying I'm trying to do a right um, It'll put a particular address on there, which will indicate that it's it's trying to write to memory, uh, and which which address in memory, and then it'll put the data on, on the data lines um, that it wants to ultimately um, transfer and be written out to memory. So, so I'm skipping over a lot of the details, but but that's kind of thing. Uh, but um, as it talks as it talks a little bit about in our textbook, um, this has gone a little bit out of favor. It's performance issues again. So. Once you start having, you know, like four, eight CPU systems, and then you have large amounts of memory, which means that you're going to have multiple um, uh, separate chips um, to, to compose. You know, so typically, if I have 64 gigabytes of memory, I don't have one 64 gigabyte chip. I might have um, um, eight 18 gigabyte chips or something like that, or four 16 gigabyte chips. You know, so 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 I mean, those are all going to be separate, and they all have to have separate. Uh, but but since they're all on a common bus, um, that ends up meaning that that the the um, the length of the bus has to uh, actually increase as I have more and more components that have to be on a common bus. So that ends up increasing the, uh, the, 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 the minimal transmission time that I'm going to be able to support. So if I have lots of components, that, that means I'm going to have some, some large or maximal length from the component on one end of the bus to the component on the other. Um, and you, you end up having to take that into account. Um, um, when you're designing, you know, the, the clock speed that your bus is going to operate at. Um, so in short, um, uh, performance can end up becoming kind, of, kind of a problem with that, um, um, with a shared bus. But I mean, these are still used uh, a lot, uh, especially though for like embedded systems and things. So, so you know, simpler computers or historical computers, um, um, or modern computers that are meant more for special purpose devices will typically, because it is simpler, uh, a, a, uh, a bus like this is, is a simpler thing to design than um, a point-to-point -point interconnect, um, like we're gonna talk about here for, for this or the PCI Express here. So. Uh, oh, there's some examples of some of the kind of control Line. So again, you'd have to have one line for every one of these types of controls. Um, so something to indicate I, I need to do a memory write or a memory read, something to indicate I need to do, um, instead do an IO device write or read. So in, and then those cases, you know, the address, like, like if I'm doing a, a, a write, um, I, I put a particular, uh, if I'm doing a write to memory, I put a, a particular address on there. But if, again, if I have multiple memory chips, um, which slot you plug those in into memory is going to to determine whether it's using like the first four gigabytes of address um, uh, to respond to for a reads or writes, or maybe the second one then uses the the second four gigabytes or whatever the size of the memory are and so on, right? Um, okay, so let's 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 look at um, these other kinds of interconnects. So, so yeah, the, I mean, the standard, the, the shared bus was kind of the standard um, for decades, according to our textbook. Um, 
and also keep in mind that that uh, my version of the textbook um, is um, from 2012 or 13 or something. So, so even this is a little bit behind. But but our textbook did have PCI Express in here, and and um, that's still pretty much the um, the big standard for um, plug-in peripheral uh, bus uh, interconnect here. So. Um, So uh, yeah, I mean the principal reason that our textbook identifies. Um, uh, so I tried to kind of explain that a little bit, or my understanding of that. So so this idea that that the increasing frequency again because of transmission delays and stuff becomes harder and harder to increase the 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 transmission frequency on your bus um, as your bus length increases, right? So you start having problems um, uh, synchronizing and stuff like that uh, and that's just only magnified because um, of, of the proliferation of multi-core uh, processor chips and, and multiple RAM modules and, and things like that um, um, although you know you might scratch your head a little bit uh, but here, here's here let, let me just kind of give you it, give it to you in a nutshell my understanding is so if, if you read the way that, that this point-to-point -point interconnect, so in particular um, in this chapter, we talk about the Intel standard. So this is what they use for um, um, Intel uh, um, microprocessor architectures um, and uh, motherboards um, that, that use this QPI standard, uh, which stands for what, Quick Path Interconnect. Uh, but really, what this is, if, if you read kind of between the lines, it, it's really a, a network, okay? So if you've ever taken a networking class, what we're defining is a standard for a network, like TCP IP networking. And so the way information moves on a point-to-point -point interconnect is, um, um, is things are transferred uh, and, and they can be routed, okay? So... Uh, um, uh, things can be connected to more than one other component on the point-to-point -point interconnect. And, and when you have multiple paths, then you're going to have routing tables and you're going to have routing layers in, in the defined protocol uh, in order that when you put something out on the, the QPI point-to-point -point interconnect, um, um, it can make decisions um, at these routing points of how to get from one point to the other um, on the on the QPI, okay? And also, like this, again, this is stuff that I wasn't really aware of until I read just this last week, but um, um, if, you, if you look at this, I mean, there's a defined protocol, uh, four-layer protocol architecture, and this is very familiar, If again, if you're familiar with, like, the definition of the TCP IP stack, you know, so also on TCP IP stack, you have physical link, uh, routing layer, um, and then you have a couple of others above this for application layers and things like that, you know, but, but, but similar kind of ideas, right? So physical layer has to do just with um, uh, down at the actual uh, physical wires, um, and, you know, and there's logic then for taking packets that arrive on the link layer and breaking that up into 20-bit um, fits to be transmitted, translated, um, and so on, and you can read, read the, the details of these, right? Um, and then, and again, like I talked about, so normally on these architectures, you, again, I mean, you don't have like software routing tables that, that can change. The, the, the routing tables are going to be hardwired in, um, um, you know, in the logic on the motherboard that you put in here based on the connections that you have between the slots for your things like your, um, uh, CPU chip slots and your your uh, RAM memory slots and and you know your I/O hubs that connect to your PCI or, or other um, kinds of peripheral device uh, things. So, um, all right. So and, and again, I encourage you though to to certainly read kind of the details of this, and, and it's, it's it's very interesting um, um, to, to get more of these. I won't go into these. Um, there was one thing I wanted to point out about this. So uh, if, if you look at um, our diagram of QPI, um, I mean, it, 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 I, I, the the description of the routing here. Uh, where is it? Um, below the figure. Um, 
Yeah, sorry. Uh, I know it describes it here somewhere. Oh, it's right here, I guess. Um, so, um, yeah, the description here about about kind of routing across this QPI network interconnect uh, doesn't quite match the figure. So it says something like, um, if core A needs to access uh, core D, um, it sends a request that would either route through B or C. So that implies that um, um, this figure isn't quite right. So I suspect that, that from this description, it should be showing uh, that we don't have these two interconnects here, but, but, but we have core A is connected to B and C, um, B is connected to A and D, you know, C you know, just that way, but, but not um, these crosswise. So if that was what the picture was, then, then this description would make sense. So if A needed to send some data over to core D, um, it would check its routing table. That would end up happening at the routing layer of the QPI. Um, and it would get routed either to, to B or C, and then from there, it would get to a st destination of, of D, right? Um, if you look at some of the documentation of uh, like white papers on Intel QPI, uh, normally they draw it as just fully connected, right? So I, I don't know, um, you know, again, I don't know, and it, it, it probably can, it can differ depending on motherboard design or not, you know, whether you, if, you know, if I have four separate processor slots, and again, it's a little bit ambiguous, you know, does this represent like the um, um, like four cores on a single CPU chip or the, does this represent like four separate processor slots on the motherboard uh, where, where internally I might have multiple cores, you know, so you can interpret that um, either way, right? So, um, so kind of to summarize that, why I, I don't think this figure is quite right. I don't know why they, but anyway, to, to match up to the description, they definitely shouldn't have had um, a direct connection from A to D there um, for, uh, for this example of routing. And um, calling this core A, B, and C, D uh, probably implies that actually all of these, as well as maybe these IO hubs, or at least these four cores are actually on a multi-core single um, integrated circuit, right? So, so you'll internally have, you know, QPI in order to do um, communication between cores, uh, but then part of the design of the integrated circuit, well, there'll be some um, lines that represent uh, QPI um, interconnects to other chips like IO hub chips or, uh, definitely your your uh, primary memory, like your um, your DRAM and stuff like that. So. All right. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that's clear, but um, but I, I mean, you know, you you probably don't have to memorize all the the details of these things but 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 i do think it it is a good idea that um, if you understand kind of this way that these modern interconnects work so because of some of these performance limitations um you know bus uh, a central bus has kind of gone out of favor and to me you know the best way the, the way that i understand these is, is these are really kind of very similar to the idea of networking if, if you ever take a, a general class in networking but yeah instead of networking between separate computers um you know across the world uh we're, we're networking between the components and subcomponents um on the motherboard of a typical general purpose computer here is what we're talking about but but we've ended up with similar ideas so <coughs> whenever we need to communicate we break things into packets we have a defined um um set of layers uh, for our, our protocol for communication. Uh, and each one of these layers takes care of different things, um, you know, like error correction, um, uh, uh, routing um, uh, uh, between the, the, I, the, the components on the QPI interconnect and, and so on, right? So to me, I mean, I think that's kind of a good way to think about it or, or visualize kind of what happens. Yeah, sure, go ahead. I, I was was trained on networks, um, yeah. and the OSI layer was uh -huh. used a lot. Yeah. 
Um, how does that fit into the OSI layer? Well, I, I think they're similar. In fact, you know, if, no, if some if people haven't have never seen a diagram of the OSI um, network layers, I'm sure we can get one pretty quickly by googling that up here. So, so yeah, it's typically usually defined as seven layers, um, mm -hmm. and and this is. Um, and those layers would kind of match up, or does it all stay in the physical layer because it's all in the well? Um, I mean, no, I mean, but but um, I mean, yeah. physical is pretty similar to the physical that we're describing um, um, here for QPI. Uh, likewise, uh, link layer probably works pretty similar to data link the layer data link, on, on yeah. the TCP/IP. So, so it, it's it's. Um, so they're not actually using those protocols. No, but, but it, it's it's it's. Uh, I, yeah, it, it's a different protocol though. It, it's it's a right. pro with, with a similar kind of breakdown of layers, but it's a different protocol for the QPI um, interconnection. That's why they have their own QPI layer for layers because it, they don't use the same protocols. Right. Yeah. That, so yeah, they definitely don't have these up above, right? So um, yeah. So above above that is really um, um, the other thing is is this yeah. is specific to Intel's when designs. Um, where the right. OSI is specifically designed but, but, to go across different hardware. Yes, right, and, yeah. and that's a good point. But but kind of like the x86 architecture, which um, is um, kind of a licensed thing, so that's why um, 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 uh, AMD uh, actually makes chips that conform to the x86 architecture. But but likewise, QPI. Uh, it's an Intel design, but uh, but yeah, I mean, other people license it, I believe, so that you can manufacture um, motherboards and, and other systems that use that same design, basically, for the interconnect. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, you know, my understanding of it, uh, um, you know, these are some, but but it's not it's not the OSI layer. So so there's going to be different details, of course, of of, of the, the definitions of the things like the packets and and how the, the the routing works and stuff like that. So yeah. Um, But the, yeah, there was a little bit of detail. So, 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 so the, I mean, again, if you read down here at the details, it gives you a little bit of an idea of what's actually happening um, on those protocol levels. Like at the link layer to translate some stream of bits out into uh, the things that actually end up down on the physical layer to, to be sent out on the, uh, the, the lanes, as, as it's called, for the, the actual physical wiring of the uh, QPI interconnect. Um, paths and so on. This came out in 2008. Um, did I read that right or did I take that number from a different place? Uh, yeah, I don't remember. Could be right. Probably uh, said they're, they're definitely They're definitely getting that idea from the OSI layer and the networking that had been around for quite a while before that. Right. right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, they said it was yeah. 2008. So. Um, okay, um, yeah, and um, our final thing here, um, so PCI um, is also a type of bus, and, and again, this is something I wasn't really familiar with before I read this, but um, you know, the original PCI standard was just called PCI, which stands for Peripheral component interconnect, uh, and and the original PCI I, I think was more like um, a shared bus. Okay, so it was more like a, um, a, a standard shared bus, like like we just uh, talked about. So so the the def, the the standard is 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 mostly of what the control lines are, and 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 and, and you know the physical lines for data and addresses and things, um, and then you know. If, if you manufacture your peripherals, so, so the what we're talking about here is a bus standard, so you can plug in peripherals. Um, and, and as I mentioned, um, kind of PCI, you might also have heard of USB, Universal Serial Bus. So these are both really uh, interconnects, definitions of standards for interconnects for 
connecting peripherals. Um, kind of as the name said, I mean, PCI is really geared towards um, high bandwidth um, parallel, so it's really kind of a parallel bus. So again, um, if uh, for kind of old timers like me, you might have remembered uh, computers used to have things they called parallel ports and serial ports, where you you could connect up one, or you might uh, might have like one parallel port and two serial ports, so you could connect up one parallel peripheral and two serial peripherals. So that's kind of evolved into a more general thing. So so the PCI is is is, is kind of like a parallel bus, a parallel port. Um, um, but, you know, the difference is, is that it's meant to be defined so you can have multiple slots. Um, so, so instead of being kind of, but, but it is still kind of physically, um, um, uh, um, uh, its origins are sort, sort of more of like a, a, um, um, a bus. So, you know, you, you might have one PCI slot or two PCI slots or four PCI slots or whatever. So, um, Oh, and USB, uh, yeah, it stands for Universal Serial Bus. Um, so, I mean, it was kind of originally, from my understanding, it was conceived to be for serial devices, you know, so, so it was more designed for to handle like mice and keyboards and things. Uh, but as you probably know, I mean, you can plug in um, uh, disks and things that you might think of as more high bandwidth. But, but yeah, I mean, the performance of USB is definitely not as good as PCI. I mean, PCI can handle GPU cards and, 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 and gigabyte Ethernet, you know, um, um, which, which I believe are going to be kind of hard for like a USB. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, USB is really serial, but it is, a, um, uh, it is also a type of peripheral interconnect. Um, USB, I mean, I get you guys all are familiar with this. As you know, it, it's, um, it allows for chained kinds of devices. So it's pretty easy to create, you know, get a USB device that has a port so you can plug in another USB device to it. Um, um, and, uh, or you can have hubs, so you can have multiple USB ports, you know, so. Um, so, but uh, to get on to PCIe, so PCIe though is an update but, you know, if you read between the lines, basically PCIe changed the standard from more of like a standard bus into a point-to-point -point interconnect. So, so PCIe now is more like a definition of a network that might have networking and you've got a defined layer of protocols. Um, and, and that makes PCIe more flexible. So, so now you are able to, to be able to have things like uh, like a switch so that, that you can then potentially uh, expand. So instead of having a hard, hard wired in like four PCIe slots, uh, you might be able to get something, you know, that, that can act as a switch and get more of them that you can get into your PCIe system. So, and again, you know, I'm, I'm not a hardware guy. So some of this stuff, I could be a little bit wrong on some of the details, but, um, uh, but, but that's kind of the general um, idea of, of what PCIe is um, and um, what it's evolved to. And PCIe is still the, the big one. So like, you know, if, if you buy a, a big NVIDIA card or uh, a big uh, um, powerful gigabit uh, ether, Ethernet NIC, um, it's, it's going to be PCIe um, probably. Um, to plug into your computer. So, so most of your general pur purpose computers uh, will have one or two or four PCIe slots, depending on what size you got. So, um, so yeah, I mean, again, PCIe is very complex. Um, I mean, the, the details are fascinating. I mean, you should definitely read them. Um, you know, get some details about some of the stuff that happens on the, 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 the three defined protocol layers for PCIe, you know, so, so translating from this layer down to the physical, you know, at the bit size. So apparently it uses, um, basically it uses like a, a, a down at the physical layer, there's a, there's a defined 128 bit path, actually 130 bit path. And then the other two bits, um, um, are basically a kind of error correction mechanism that happens at like the data link or the physical layer 
uh, you know, describes it a little bit in here, kind of what's happening with those. So, um, or, or really not, I guess not data correction, but um, something about different types of, um, whether it's like a data block or a different type of block. So anyway, I didn't, I didn't completely dig down into all the details, but, um, um, all right. Yeah, I think, I think we hit all the points that I wanted to talk about um, or bring up. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think that's all I kind of had, uh, whether, uh, any kinds of questions you might want to ask about or things you want to discuss before we call the day. I was just looking at the numbers because the USB type C is getting awful close, if not surpassing, because it sounds like they've got new technology out that allows it to surpass the PCIe. Yeah, really? Um, yeah. I mean, you know, so. Yeah. Um, There's yeah. something called Thunderbolt that they've come out with. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just found out about it just because I was looking at it, the, the rates comparison to see where they're at. Um, huh. so the yeah. Thunderbolt 3 is um, using USB Type-C and it can hit, I guess it goes up to 10 gigabits per second. Um, right. Yeah, so that's, I mean, you know, that is true because I knew that, for example, nowadays you can get like an external uh, USB plugins, I mean, certainly for hard drives, everybody uses those, um, and, and they're, they're fine. Yeah. But, uh, but I've been seeing like people getting like display adapters, so like an external GPU, so that uh, oh, wow. you know, things like that, that 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 use USB for to drive a display. So yeah, interesting. The, the technology how it changes. Yeah. So. <clears throat> Dr. Arno, I have a question. Sure. Uh, I heard uh, for hard drive they use uh, SATA or PARA ATA sometimes. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Those. Yeah, that's a good question. So those that's that was another kind of bus standard. So again, you know, I might be saying some things that aren't hundred percent correct here, but but yeah, SATA stand for it was like serial, uh, something transfer or something. So um, and um. um Another popular older one was, um, oh shoot, I'm gonna draw a blank. What was that? Um, um, but, 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 but yeah, so, so we are talking about similar things. And, and um, yeah, a, a current PC might still have, uh, I mean, you still might be using um, SHEA um, for, your, uh, for your main hard drives, you know, for, so for your big um, hard drive or, or your big, um, um, solid state drive nowadays maybe so so yeah i mean that, that's that that is still used a lot for for hard drive um i suspect again if you kind of go back and look at some of the the diagrams like for the qpi interconnect so, so i suspect that uh you know like, like thinking of inner uh, of, of intel and the qpi what you'll see is that there there would be a specific um io chip that can interact with QPI on one end, but then um, it is for the for SATA, uh, so connecting an SATA, and that that would work as a bridge from from the older SATA to get it onto the the QPI, you know, so you can still connect your um, uh, SATA devices. So. so SATA is not a kind of uh, PCI. Um, yeah, it's, it's different from, from PCI. So, so it's, it's yet another kind of, uh, interconnect standard. So. That old one you were thinking of, was it EIED? Uh, no, but the, yeah, that's another one. Um, but yeah, I mean, SATA is, a, is like, again, I think it's a serial kind of standard, um, which basically means instead of having like, you know, 64, you know, uh, 32 or 64 lines to transfer a bunch of data in parallel. There's mostly going to be one, um, but they define it in such a way so it's fast enough to work with high performance uh, drives and things. So, 
but yeah, that's a good question. And those, those would all be good things to, uh, I really should kind of update myself a little bit maybe. And, um, but because yeah, I think, I think the SAT has, 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 um, evolved, you know, so, so there, there are new standards, um, um and, and is, is still used certainly for desktop PCs and things. So. Um, Uh, yeah, I, I can't remember. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, a good question. And and yeah, I mean, you know, I I don't completely know all the the details of all that, but uh, but my understanding is, you know, again, it is the stuff we're talking about here. It's a type of uh, bus interface standard, predominantly for hard drive, basically predominantly for optical drives. So so it was built for rotating magnetic. And then later for um, rotating the uh, uh, laser uh, light um, um, medium. So, but it, but it, you know, but the uh, solid state drives that don't have any of those rotational medium um, still um, also though mostly probably work with SATA um, input. So. Thank you, sir. Uh, and I have a, another request. Uh, could you uh, re the chapter three notes? Because I don't see uh, 3.22 in the file you uploaded on D2L. Uh -huh. uh, I downloaded the file. In oh, uh, yeah, good question. So, uh, yeah, sorry about that. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I was, I, I, I uploaded that file more than once. So if you, if you, um, if you got it like on two, um, yesterday or the day before, you might have had an older version. But, but yeah, the one that I was showing here today, if you just go and download it again, should be there, I think. So let me double check. But, um, yeah, I just downloaded it before class. It's there. Yeah, so I mean, I, I did just uh, add some new notes like um, this morning or like a actually after 12 or so. So, so yeah, you, you might have been missing some stuff if you got it before um, 12 today. So, but, but yeah, if, if you want to, you should be able to get it. You just have to go get it again. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, yeah, okay, good. So, any, any others? Okay, well, uh, yeah. Can, I, can we stay on a few minutes afterwards to anyone okay. to ask a question? <laughs> okay, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, kind of stop the recording here. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, keep working on the textbook and I'll try and get a little bit ahead here so I can have some other stuff. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys next week then. I just want to make sure that um, we're in for